Okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you about peeling the banana. It's a bit obscure. So first of all, I, I just want a show of hands. How many people actually know about the banana that we're going to peel? It's called a catamorphism. Okay, so I see. All right, I think that that's around less than 5% of you. And that's a great sign, because it means I can tell you all. All right. Um, okay, so. <coughs> The kind of banana we are going to peel is not a snack, unfortunately. Um, it comes from a paper with a rather friendly title, Functional Programming with uh, Bananas, Lenses, Envelopes, and Barbed Wire. And yeah, it's, it's really friendly, right? I mean, if we're, we've got this title, we know we can go and understand it, right? Um, and this paper, it was published in 1991, around 25 years ago, and so you'd kind of think, okay, We've, we've had enough time, right? These techniques, they should surely be something that we're using today all the time, because it, it's an absolutely fantastic paper. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And you know, I'm not quite sure why. Um, I think perhaps part of it is because this paper deals with rec recursion. And recursion itself is a pretty difficult concept. Um, I don't know if you guys can remember the first time you wrote a factorial function back in the days you know, when you started learning functional programming. Um, I, I don't know if you can remember the pain that you must have gone through in trying to get it to work, and the enlightenment that you got at the end when you could finally write one that you actually terminated. Um, and I think that we all go through this, and recursion becomes something that we don't really want to touch. And understandably so, right? Because it's so easy to write programs that don't terminate or do the wrong thing, and they're so hard to debug if they're recursive. But I think that there's a bit more to it than that. Um, perhaps it's also because of notation. Now, uh, I don't know if you guys, um, you, you all saw yesterday's keynote, right, about the hazards that notation can bring to a discipline. And um, this paper does have some rather obscure syntax in, and in its defense, it explains it all. Um, <laughs> so they do define uh, it, and, and if you do uh, take the time to read it, just take it slow, but everything's there. I think perhaps the biggest reason why it's not been adopted is because this technique doesn't arise from conventional functional programming. Uh, it doesn't arise necessarily from lambda calculus, um, and you can't see it quite easily when you're looking at code. It actually comes from category theory. And for a long time, category theory has been a completely different discipline, and it hasn't really uh, pervaded functional programming as much as it should have done. And so what I want to try and do in this talk is show you how we can use category theory to solve some problems which you, know, you might not think would be solvable, and how we can abstract over what we do, taking something from a different discipline. Uh, okay, so. What we're going to do is first take a look at recursive data types themselves and see if we can find out what they are. We're going to dive into category theory to try and solve some problems that we get when we try and generalize them. And we'll derive recursion schemes. Now, I want to say one thing, which is um, don't panic. Oh, I can see a banana. That's great. That, that's, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we're already there, halfway anyway. Um, yeah, don't panic, because there are going to be a few terms in this talk which you might have not heard before. Don't concentrate on the terms. Concentrate on the concept and what they represent. Terms are useful when we know what they mean and we're trying to communicate with other people. But when we're learning a field, they get in the way. OK, let's make a start. Uh, recursive data types. I'm sure that you guys have probably all worked with lists before. And this is probably your most basic example. Um, this is Haskell. Um, I figured that Haskell would be OK here. I do have a backup presentation in Scala, if that's more preferable. But no, we're all OK. All right. Um, oh, yeah. So this is a recursive data type in Haskell. I've removed the parameter on list, so this just represents a list of ints. And we know it's recursive because it references itself. Now, I've got a question for you. If I gave you one of these lists, would it terminate? Could you be sure that it would terminate? No. You couldn't. Not in Haskell, anyway. Now, in some languages, you could. If you're working in Scala, this list would terminate. Um, but Haskell is a lazy language, which means it doesn't evaluate things as soon as it gets it. And you know, this is a major problem. Um, 
it means that when you're writing functions, you're not quite sure if they're ever going to end if you're operating on a list. You have to be very careful. And unfortunately, I don't have a solution in this talk. So <laughs> what I want you to imagine is that all the uh, data structures that we're dealing with, all of them are terminating structures. So yeah, basic example of a list uh, of three numbers here. Now the cool thing about a structure that terminates is that I can write a function to collapse it. Um, I've got two functions here, one multiply, which multiplies all the elements in our list, and one length, which calculates the length of our list. Now, again, I'll reiterate, if I did this on an infinite data structure, it would not be good. <laughs> but I can do it on a finite one. So they look pretty similar, don't they? Um, in our nil case over here, we're returning one. In nil over here, we're returning zero. Uh, we're doing something else in our cons case. In our cons case, we are calling again our function. And so you kind of get the intuition that if you want to collapse a recursive data structure, you're going to need to write a recursive function to do so. And so that gets really annoying. Um, luckily, what we can do is that we can take a look at these functions, and there are a few things that are similar and a few things that are different, and we can take out the parts that are similar and put them in something else, and it's called a fold. Um, how many of you have used folds before? Great. You're all doing the right thing. That's good. Um, yeah, we, we shouldn't write recursive functions using explicit recursion. We really should use folds. They make life so much easier. Um, what we've done is that we've taken the recursive part, and we've stuck it in this function, and now for all of our actual logic, the thing that doesn't do the recursion but is necessary to compute multiply or length, we've taken that out and said, let's pass those in as functions. And so over here, I've got a function multiply, the same function, but now defined using fold. And it's a lot simpler. Now, these functions which take a recursive data structure and collapse them down are also known as catamorphisms. So it's a complicated term for something which we've all been doing. Now, the interesting thing is that I can actually write this for a different data structure. I can take a binary tree. Um, hold on. Yeah, I don't know where my binary tree is. Um, I can take a binary tree and write a fold for such a thing. If it has a leaf, then I can write a function to collapse a leaf. If it writes a node, then I can write another function um, to collapse a node. And what this does is that, again, I've captured my recursion inside my fold. And again, if I want to write now a recursive collapse for a binary tree, all I need to do is provide a function for what I want to do in the case of a leaf and what I want to do in the case of a node. And so again, I've got a fold function um, on, a, on a list and a fold function on a tree. Now, if you take a look at these two data structures and these two fold functions that we've written, they're pretty similar, aren't they? Um, in both of them, I have to deal with each case. I have to deal with the nil case in the list and the cons case. In a tree, I have to deal with the leaf and with the node. And they both collapse them. But apart from that, they don't have much similarities. And so if I was to pose the problem to you, how would you generalize this? Could you write a single function which would do the job of both of these folds? How would you go about doing it? And you know, it's hard to make a start on that. Maybe we could um, you know, launch into the world of dependent types and see if we could use Idris for something like this. It seems to be the solution to almost all our problems these days. Um, that wouldn't be a good thing to do. Uh, maybe we would get somewhere. It would be interesting to see if anyone tried. Uh, but there's actually a better solution. We're going to use category theory. And category theory, OK, it's a very different discipline, and it's a lot more abstract. Um, I'm going to explain what this diagram means. It's basically the whole of category theory, by the way. So if you understand this diagram, then you know, you've understood the whole field. It deals with composition. We essentially say that, OK, I've got two things. I've got objects, which aren't that important. They're just points. And I've got these arrows, which go from object to object. And they compose. So I can perform arrow f, and then perform arrow g. And that's just the same as performing f and g, and this is a composition rule. I also have a special arrow called id, in which I go from an object to the same object, and that doesn't do anything. 
So you know, if I can do ID and then F, and that's the same as just doing F and then ID on this one, which is just the same as doing F. So ID does nothing. Um, and also, if I uh, have composition, if I'm composing F and then G and then something else, H, that's just the same as composing F and then composition of G and H. And this looks really similar to function composition, doesn't it? And so we can actually use category theory to model uh, function composition in programming. And the way that we do that is that we say, okay, our objects in category theory are A, B, and C, those are types. And these arrows here, those are functions. And so we can use this to represent what we do when we code. So let's pose our problem in category theory. I've said that what I want to do is take a general recursive structure and collapse it into a single value. And all the things I have in category theory, the only tools I have are composition. So the way that I need to do that is that I need to find some arrow that goes from a recursive object, recursive type A, to another type, sorry, recursive type R to another type A. And the only way I can do that is through composition. So I need to find some other stuff to compose to make this function. But before I do that, I'm going to take a step back. And I'm going to take a look at our recursive data structure again, our list. And I'm going to do something interesting with it. I am going to make it higher kinded, but not higher kinded in the sense that you normally see lists. I'm going to pull the recursive part out of it. This thing used to be list. I'm going to pull it out and make it a type parameter. And so if you look at this thing, it's not a list anymore, because I can put anything in there. I can put, for example, a string. I can write foo as cons f of one foo. Or what I could do is that I could repeatedly apply it to itself. Now, if I repeatedly apply it to itself, it looks kind of like the list that I initially had, doesn't it? So let's try and define what this kind of like is. Um, what we mean is that I can convert from a list f of a list into a list without losing any information. So I can go from nil f to nil. I can go from cons f of head and a tail to cons of head and a tail, provided that this tail is a list. So I can go from uh, a list f to a list. And you know, I can also do the same. I can go from a list to a list f of a list. And again, the only thing I do is really replace these constructors. Instead of nil, I go to nil f. Instead of cons, I go to cons f. And so, OK, that's kind of interesting, right? I, I basically um, can go from one to the other. And the way that we write that in category theory is something that's known as an isomorphism. And it's just a complicated term for saying, these two things, I can convert between them without losing anything. So we've said that we've got our recursive type R. Uh, that's our list, right? And we've got some other type FR. That's our list F. And I've written some functions in that go from a list F of a list to a list, and out, which go from a list to a list F of a list. And these two functions are such that if I compose them, if I go in and then out, that's just the same as ID, because I haven't done anything, right? And just as well, let's say that um, I, uh, I start with my initial recursive structure, and then I go out and then in, that's also the same as ID, because I haven't done anything. So, OK, th I said this is a useful concept, but um, you might think, OK, well, it's kind of useless, right? I mean, I'm, I'm just saying that I'm not doing anything. What's the use in that? And it turns out that um, our list f is useful because it brings us a few new tools to work with. And one of the things that it brings us is a functor. So who's worked with functors before? Yeah, OK, most of you. That's good. Um, a functor in category theory means almost the same thing. It's something which takes some object A into some other object, FA. Um, so I can take a type list and take it into a list f of a list. Uh, it's something that takes a, a morphism, so that's this arrow, from A to B, and turns into another morphism from FA to FB. So I can take some function f, and I've got some operation, I'm going to call it map, which takes this function and turns it into a function from FA to FB. So this is the same as the functors that you see in Haskell and Scala in, in whatever language. Um, it's just a map operation, plus this thing that takes types into types. So 
this is what a functor looks like in Haskell. Um, pretty simple, right? Just this map operation. I take a function from A to B and turn it into a function from FA to FB. And I can implement this for list F. Um, I can say that map on nil does nothing. Map on cons F means I apply it to my tail. And you know, it's pretty interesting, because you can actually derive this, I think, probably using some language extension. Maybe you can you do it in just standard Haskell. I don't know. Um, you can actually derive this in Haskell. And it will derive this functor for you, because um, it, there are rules behind it. So functors give us something else. Uh, they give us something which is called an F algebra, which is just a, a complicated way of saying that I want to go from an FA to A, and I have an arrow to get there. Um, so this is just a function, right? It's a function that goes from FA to A. And I can code this up in Haskell. I can say, uh, I can put a type alias for it, uh, type alias algebra for something that goes from FA to A. And you've already seen one of these before. In fact, the uh, function list that I defined earlier, this thing, uh, oh, sorry, the function in that I defined earlier, this is actually an F algebra. Uh, it goes from list f of list to list. So I'm going to define another one here uh, called multiply algebra. Uh, just arbitrarily, it's not as though I'm doing anything, any kind of multiplication. Of course we are. Um, we define one and we say, okay, in my nil case, I'm going to return one. Uh, in my cons case, I've got two integers here, remember, and I'm going to multiply those together. Okay, so um, let's try and put all of this together and see what we get. Remember, we've got uh, three ingredients here. First of all, what we had is our recursive type. And what we want to get is some other type A. We want to collapse it onto this type A. We started off by defining a higher kinded data structure, list F, which is this type FR. And we said that that's kind of interesting because we have an isomorphism between them. We can go in and out between those two. And we also said that, hey, this thing is a functor. That means I can map. So if I did have this, this function kata, I could also write a function map kata, which went from fr to some other thing fa, right? And we also looked at algebras, and we said, well, an algebra is just this arrow that goes from fa to a. And remember I said the only thing that you can do in category theory when you're trying to prove something is through composition. Can any of you see a way of composing some of these arrows together to actually come up with a definition of a catamorphism? I'll give you a moment. You can take a look. OK, so this is the one that I came up with. I think it's the only possible one. Um, if we start with R, we can go out, and then we get to FR. We can then perform map kata to get to FA. And then we can operate our algebra and go back to A. And we can write this like this. We say out, and then map kata, and then out. And this translates really well to Haskell. So this is what it looks like in Haskell. I can say I've got some function kata, which provided that f is a functor, I can take in an algebra and something that should be my out of my isomorphism. And I can return a function that goes from r to a. And you define it like this. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. And so what I can do is that I can now say, OK, let's say that I take my multiply algebra and I take the out that I defined for a list f, and I put those together, then I actually get the multiply function that I started out with. So I actually get a recursive collapse. And I just want to take a moment here and you know, congratulate ourselves on what we've done, because it's actually really cool, right? Um, this function is going to work for anything which has a functor, right? Uh, well, particular kinds of functors, right? Anything which has a functor for any kind of algebra that I provide, which means that what I've done is that I've achieved what I set out to in the beginning, right? I have now written a function which is equivalent to my fold on my list and my fold on my tree together. And this will actually work for any recursive data structure. All I need to do is define some functor representation for it. And then what I can do is that I can collapse it. And you know, the other really cool thing about this right, is that because we've done so using category theory, it's not just applicable to Haskell. It's actually applicable to any language, provided you can model that language as a category. 
provided that you can say what the objects are and what the composition is. You can use this technique. And so maybe, maybe we can go further than that. Um, let, let's not just stop here. What about another problem? What about the problem of building stuff up, of unfolding? Let's say that what I actually did is that um, I want to construct a list now. And I want to construct a list from an integer. I want to construct a range of numbers. And I'm going to define a function here, range. And I take in a number. If it's greater than 0, then I want to do a cons of n and n minus 1. And if it is 0 or, or less, then I want to return nil. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to build a range of numbers um, going down. So it'll be something like 3, 2, 1. And this thing has a technical term. It's called an anamorphism. Um, in the paper, I think, uh, let's see, it's also it's a lens in the paper. Now, I, I should say that this lens is not the same as most of the lenses that you will normally see in functional programming. Don't get confused. Just call it an anamorphism or call it an unfold. They're equivalent, they're the same thing. And so we might think, OK, well, we've used this technique to derive catamorphisms. Maybe we can use it again to derive this thing, anamorphisms. So we want to go now from A to R. We want to build our recursive data structure. And this is what we've defined so far. Maybe there's a path. Maybe there's a way of composing all these things together. Um, can you see one? No. No confused faces. That's good. That's good. That's because there isn't one over here. Um, but what I can do is instead of providing an algebra, what if I provide a co-algebra? What if I say, OK, my function now should go from A to an F of an A? Now if I do this, then is there a way of composing them? Yeah, we just go around, don't we? Yeah. And so using this path in green, I can actually come up with a derivation of an anamorphism. I can say I want to have a co-algebra, then map of my anamorphism, then in. And similarly, I can write this in Haskell. And it's also fairly simple. I say, provided that I have a functor, and I've got a co-algebra, and I have something um, which is to represent my in, then I can write a function that goes from A to R, again, for any recursive data structure. And so I can write my range like this. I can say, OK, here's my range co-algebra. If uh, n is 0, then I want a cons f of n and n minus 1, or I want a nil f. So this is looking pretty similar to the uh, initial function we had. And I can define this now using an anamorphism. So that's pretty cool. Maybe we should stop there. Should we stop there? No, we, we can keep going, can't we? we? We can keep going. Come on. What about recursion itself? Let's say that I don't actually have a recursive data structure. I've just got a recursive function. Um, this is a factorial function. It's one of the ones that plagues us when we start functional programming. Factorial and Fibonacci. I just discovered that you can get worse than that. There are worse recursive functions that you can write. Um, but yeah, when I was starting out, this one was terrible. It, it looks simple, but it's not to come up with, right? Um, so we take a factorial of n, and what we say is that, OK, if n is greater than 0, then n times the factorial of n minus 1 or 1. So we've got a recursive function. And actually, factorial is kind of special, because what it does is that it builds up a call tree and collapses it. And so we can call it a hylomorphism. And maybe we can use the tools that we have to try and tackle this problem. So let's try. I'm just putting everything that we've done so far onto a diagram and seeing what happens. Right? <laughs> This is, you know, if, if you're not too familiar with what you're doing, just splurge stuff on and you might get an answer. Um, so yeah, this is the stuff we had from catamorphisms. This is the stuff that we had from anamorphisms. And this is what I want to do. I've got some type A. I want to get to some type B. Maybe there's some intermediate recursive data structure for it, possibly. And so we can say, is there a way of writing this? Can you see one? Yeah, there are many ways, actually, to define a hylomorphism using this. I could go here, and then here, and then here. Or maybe I could go here, and then here, and then here. Um, the path that I'm going to choose is this one. I'm going to say, let's apply our co-algebra. 
Then let's map our holomorphism. And then let's apply our algebra. And this path is kind of special, actually, compared to the other ones, because I'm completely bypassing the data structure in the middle. And that's really important, because it means that when we're actually running this computation, it's a lot more efficient than if we were to actually construct this thing. So this is what it looks like. Um, again, we need a functor. We need a coalgebra and an algebra. Uh, notice that we don't actually need the isomorphism. We don't need in or out here. And that's pretty interesting. Um, but I think that we kind of need them to exist. But I don't know. Uh, so we can actually write our factorial in terms of this. Because we can say, what if I take my range coalgebra, the thing that built up a range of numbers, and then I take my multiply algebra, the thing that multiplied a range of numbers, and I put those together, I can get a factorial function. And the reason why this is so cool is that these two things, range coalgebra and multiply algebra, they were defined in terms of our list, weren't they? They were defined in terms of our list f, in fact, our list functor. But factorial itself, we never think of lists when we're doing factorials, do we? But now we've discovered a relationship between them. And that's actually because the tree of a factorial, if we were to actually examine it, would be similar to a list. And so maybe we can try and get this intuition about other recursive functions that we deal with. Maybe we can take a look and see what their call trees look like. Maybe they look like B trees or something more, more advanced. But, okay, there, there is something which I haven't shown you, right? Um, I, I should make a confession here. We've discovered this really new tech, cool new technique and we can apply it to so many things. And it can give us so much power now, because we can now apply generalized collapse to any kind of recursive structure. But we need to define quite a few things for it. Um, in particular, what we did was we had our initial data structure. Then we defined a functor for it. And then we defined a way of going between them, these two functions in and out. And that's a lot of stuff to do, right? We don't want to have to do that for every single data structure. That's almost the same as saying, OK, you have to write a fold for every single data structure. So maybe there is a way of getting around this boilerplate. What we really want to do is say that, <coughs> let's say that we define our list f, our, our functor. Maybe we can come up with some other data type foo such that in and out are defined for that data type foo for any functor that we have. This is actually pretty difficult to come up with. Um, you can stare at this for ages. You're probably not going to find an answer. But there is one, and it's called fix. It looks a bit bizarre, because it essentially takes some higher kind of type f uh, and wraps it. And so we can actually write in and out for it, for this bizarre type, because in, if you take a look at it closely, is just our constructor here. And out is just this unfix operation. And so if we write whatever recursive data structure we have, if we write that in terms of fix and our functor, then essentially we get these things for free. So we can actually depend on some library to provide us with this. And we can just write this stuff. And that's really cool. You know, I, I could go on and on and, and keep going with this, because um, we've done some cool things, but there are, there are way more. Um, we could take a look at fusion, for example. You might have heard of fusion with functors, where, where you take two functions and you put them together, and you can actually perform a map over both of them instead of performing individual ones. You can actually do that with folds, and that's really exciting. Um, we could even take a look at comenads and see where they come into the picture. Um, they make our diagrams in category theory even more exciting and complicated, but um, <laughs> they give us some really, really cool things. And in particular, what they give us is even more ways of folding over our data structure. Because we've only looked at one way. We've only looked at the catamorphism, the normal collapse. There are actually others. Um, we could go and look at paramorphisms or zygomorphisms, which sound confusing, but I tend to look at the signatures more than you look at the words. Uh, and they make a bit more sense. But unfortunately, I think we, we probably don't have too much time. So what I will say is go and do those later. Definitely go and play around with them. Um, and you know what? What I want the takeaways for this to be are not only that we've managed to define a generalized collapse, that's a great thing that we've managed to do, um, but also that we could have actually done this 25 years ago. 
we could have actually done this when Haskell was starting and integrated it right into the language. And so maybe every single data structure in some kind of parallel universe, every single recursive data structure that people deal with in functional programming automatically comes with all these recursion schemes. But that didn't quite happen. Um, I think that at the time, maybe people didn't spend enough time learning about these other disciplines and learning about category theory and seeing what it can give to us. And so what I want your takeaway to be from this is that if we go and try and look at other disciplines and transform our problem into other spaces, then we can get a lot more insight on solving problems than the way we would normally. We could have stared at those functions in the beginning for ages, you know, stared at our list and our tree and tried to combine them, but we probably wouldn't have found a way unless we'd gone and transformed it into another discipline. And so category theory and trying to use it in functional programming is really awesome. And there are loads of other disciplines too, and we can try and use those. Now, some of the stuff that I've mentioned actually already does exist. Uh, there's a library in Scala called Matryoshka, which is where I started playing around with them. Um, it's by Slam Data. There is recursion schemes in Haskell by the wonderful Ed Kmet, who's done a load of other amazing stuff as well. And recently, I've also discovered one in Idris. Um, and it'd be interesting to see how that one actually works, uh, because I, I reckon that it should work in a slightly different way to Haskell and Scala because of the way that the language is written. So I recommend you to go and pick your favorite one. Of course, we all know that your favorite one is going to be Idris, right, out of all these. It's the mainstream language now. <laughs> <laughs> go and play around with it and see what you can do. And if you want to know more, here are a few resources, a few things that pretty much summarize what I've done as well. Um, definitely look at the paper. I think a lot of people don't give it enough, um, enough of a chance because it has a lot of confusing notation. But if you just take these diagrams and draw them next to it, it'll make things a lot clearer, I think. Um, there's also an article on understanding F-algebras by Bartosz Malowski. Bartosz has done a load of, um, he, he's written a load of blog posts and a few books recently on trying to make category theory approachable to programmers. And I think they're a great place to start. Uh, if you're more interested in fix, because <coughs> that is a really mind-boggling thing, uh, take a look at Recursive Types for Free by Philip Wadler. Uh, it goes into how the fixed point type, um, uh, well, some of the problems with it and where it arises from. And if you actually want to see a, a really cool use of recursion schemes, uh, I'd recommend this one because it's data type generic programming. And what it does is that it tries to use recursion schemes to model object-oriented patterns, which is something that you, know, you kind of think, well, how do you do that, right? It, it's really cool, the fact that you can take this and you can go and model things like visitor patterns and strategy patterns. That's something else that hasn't quite caught on. It'd be interesting to see its applications. And yeah, thank you for listening. Oh, cool. That's great. Shall we go back? Uh, had a lot more slides than I thought. Um, OK, uh, so get the pointer. First of all, this is a, um, we're trying to get this function, this catamorphism. We're trying to get it. We don't have a definition yet. But what we do have is that we have this um, type f, which we know is a functor. So what we can say is that if we have a functor, we have a map. Maybe if I go a few slides back, I'll show you the functor. This one. So what a functor does is that for any function here, f, we can basically define another function, map f, by mapping that. And I can show you the, here's an example, right? Um, so this is our functor for list. We take in some function f from a to b, and we say that, okay, that's now a function for list f. It goes from list f of a to list f of b, and it does that by operating on the a inside. Okay, following? So if we have that, that means that for any function we define up here, we can define a corresponding one down here. And so couple that with our isomorphism and also some other algebra which we provide, the multiply algebra was something we wrote, then we can actually loop around like this. 
Okay. I don't know. What's the interpretation of the int in the type signature of listf? Um, Maybe something I missed as well. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean? Uh. <laughs> uh, do you mean um, this int? Uh, yes. Right, yeah. so we're representing lists of integers here, only lists of integers. So th the important thing to realize here is that um, this isn't our normal list, even though it's parameterized by a type, right? The thing that you'd normally see is these swapped around, right? And you'd see a list on the tail and some value A. And that would mean that, okay, I've now defined a list which I can put any type in. I can have a list of ints or a list of strings or a list of something else. What I've actually done here is said, okay, this is just a list of, well, it's something which contains an int and some other thing A, which means that I can do this, right? I can put a string in there and it's not a list anymore. So we could also parameterize over int as well. Oh, yeah, okay. you could certainly do that. Um, it's just for concreteness that we do this yes. over ints. And the interesting thing, right, is that um, that would essentially mean that, uh, let's say that we did put two parameters here. We put an A and a B. Normally, what you'd want to do is you'd think of your, OK, I've got a list of A. My list is also a functor. That's normally what you'd think. Um, to get that functor, you would actually define it using either a catamorphism or an anamorphism. And that makes sense if you think about it, because if you think about the definition of a functor for list, if you try and write one, you actually do collapse a list, and you build up another one as you're doing so. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, there was another part that I didn't get that the, in the definition of high-low. Maybe I should just kind of flick forward like this. Um, uh, where is Hilo? Those two words there. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, the code, implement uh, the implementation of it. Yeah. Uh, you're calling Hilo again. It looks like recursive function without stop condition. Um, without yeah. the stop condition. Oh, so how does it work? Yeah, how, how would it stop this yeah. recursion? Um, it actually comes down to our functor. So if we were to take a look at our functor, <coughs> it's a really interesting question. It's one that I got confused about a lot when looking at it the first time as well. Um, right. If we take a look at this, um, when we have nil, we don't do anything with the function anymore. So even if this thing here is a recursive function which calls itself, I'm not going to call it anymore as soon as I get to my nil case. So in our hylomorphism, we had an anamorphism which built up and a catamorphism which folded down. As long as that data structure terminates, we'd, have, we'd encounter this nil, and we'd basically throw away the recursion. Is that clear? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Hi. So, an interesting talk. Um, and uh, I'd like to say that I've been playing around with some ideas like this with my PhD student, David Castro. Um, so, we, we'd like to chat to you a bit about that afterwards. But I want to say, um, you said if Haskell had known a bit, if the Haskell designers had known a bit more about category theory, we would have done things differently. And I would say that when we were designing Haskell, we actually spent a lot of time learning about category theory. It was very, very popular at the time. So we, we looked at um, a lot of things, in not, not necessarily these things exactly, but monads, of course, come yes. from an understanding of category theory. And we also looked at things like vibrations, which you haven't mentioned, which are really quite complicated. Uh, we felt that at the time, Haskell was supposed to be, it was supposed to be a conservative language design. <laughs> this was this was in the job description. <laughs> the job description of Hassel was it was supposed to be conservative. Although we could see there's some really nice patterns here, we felt it was just too soon to try to introduce these to the mass of uh, to the world at large. We didn't think people would accept Haskell if we did that. Now <laughs> I can see the world has changed, and this is great. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Got 
hide the, the type parameter in the functor? Is yeah. What's the role of that? Um, is that what you're collapsing into? What is the role of the type parameter in the functor? Uh, the pattern functor. In the list f. The list f. Uh, OK, so if I go to back to the definition of the list f. Do, 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 do. Um, here. Um, OK, so what we've done here is that we've taken the, the recursive part, the list, and pulled it out and made it a type parameter here, right? What that means is that this thing does not necessarily need to contain a list f, right? It could contain anything else. And if you think about it, not in terms of category theory, but in terms of what you're doing in the code, what you'll see is that you're actually substituting the thing that you're, let's say you're doing a collapse. You put the thing that you're collapsing inside there, the thing that you're accumulating. <coughs> so if we take a look at the algebras further on, um, where do we have them? Yeah, here. If we take a look at multiply algebra, right? Uh, this thing that I'll get here is the multiplied value that I'm accumulating at that point. Right. So let's say that I have a list of three, two, one, um, and what I have in the head is is three. What I'll have in the tail is well, it'll actually be two because it'll be two times one, right? Um, and then I'll multiply those together. So you can think of it almost as though what I can do now, if I make this thing higher kinded, is that I can contain the thing that I'm accumulating or um, folding out of if you're building a structure. Yeah, thank you. OK, any more questions? Right. Oh. No? You sure? <laughs> so perhaps what I should have asked earlier when I was asking about um, what is the interpretation of int is um, if it were string what would the factorial function be? Oh. <laughs> so, okay, so let's say that I wanted to go to from string to string, right? I would still have to write different algebras. Um, I don't know what your range algebra would be for a string, and I don't know what your multiplication would be, but you'd have to define those. But if you did define those, then you could come up with a factorial function for a string. You'd have to define what multiplication meant. Um, OK. Thank you. All right. And any more? So it's definitely a list, right? Uh, if we look at the type of algebra here, it goes from f, a of a, f of a to a. So this is going to go from a list f of int to int, which, yeah, so this thing is definitely an int. 